How do you attach a clerical collar? Hello and welcome to That Deacon on YouTube. If you've been a regular viewer of the channel, you'll notice that every once in a while I like to offer instruction videos. The idea for this tutorial sprung out of what I think is a really cute story. A few years back, a diaconal candidate for ordination was helping out with laundry love. And as all the washers were washing and all the dryers were drying, we were able to stand around and chat for a bit. During a pause in the conversation, he said that he had a question for me. Fine, I said, ask away thinking it was some important question about some great theological paradox involving the diaconate and our role in representing the church to the world and the world to the church. His question was this, how do you attach a clerical collar? Well, I went on and explained how one attaches what is lovingly called a dog collar. But inwardly, I thought, how endearing that this soon-to-be-ordained deacon felt comfortable coming to me with a basic question, one of those things you don't learn in seminary. I then remember thinking back to the time when my own father showed me how to tie a necktie, one of those rites of passage. And this brings me to today's topic. Not so very important facts about clerical callers. I must admit, when I was a layperson, I was curious about those callers and how they worked. I used to attend a Wednesday morning rector's Bible study when Harold, our rector, would sit down and sometimes take off his collar and set it on the table. And I remember thinking, how does he attach that thing? Now, before I get into all that, I thought it might be nice to share a bit of history about clerical collars. You might be surprised to find out that clerical street clothing is not as old as you think. But at the heart of it all is that a clergy person wearing a collar is letting the public know that they are an ordained minister. It's a uniform. The mindset of the person wearing the uniform is another subject, and I think I'll save that discussion for another time and another video. And now, a bit of history. In the early church, religious leaders did not wear distinctive clerical dress. It was not until the Middle Ages when the beginnings of a clerical uniform began to be seen. The reason for this change was to differentiate lay scholars from clergy. Academics would wear an open robe with a hood, and clergy began to wear a cassock, so that when out and about, people could tell the difference. A leftover from this period is still with us today as seen by the cassock and the tippet. The tippet was originally a form of outdoor dress, and it may have been fur-lined. Much of its history has been tied with academic use. It was adopted by clergy for use during the prayer offices of the day to distinguish the choir from liturgical leaders. 
It is still used today for prayer services by bishops, priests, and deacons. The origin and beginnings of what would become the clerical collar stem from the time of the Reformation and Protestantism. Clergy wished to distinguish themselves from Roman Catholic clergy. In the 18th century, Protestant clergy began to wear a neck scarf or cravat, as seen in this painting of Presbyterian minister and theologian Charles Hodge. It was also at this time where other Protestant clergy began to wear a preaching tab or neckband. Moving on to the 19th century, the fashion of the day began to turn collars down. If you look at Hodge's portrait again, you will see that the collar of the neck cravat turned up. In the 19th century, most shirt collars were detachable and were attached using a stud. This style was invented to help with laundry costs, as it was much easier to wash a collar than an entire shirt. At some point in time, a Protestant cleric took the turn-down collar and reversed it, leaving what we know as the yoke, or band around the neck. This eventually morphed into the band collar we see today. In towns where there were both Roman Catholic clergy and Protestant pastors, the general public would see Protestant clerics wearing a collar, and Roman Catholic clergy dressed in a cassock. So, in effect, what is called the Roman collar is actually Presbyterian, and the Anglican cassock is actually Roman. Just a reminder, if you enjoy these monthly video offerings, it would be helpful if you can press the like button. YouTube algorithms do not rely on keywords, but it does rank channel interests by likes. And while I'm at it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and click on the bell icon to be informed when a new video has been made available. I hope you enjoyed that little brief history into how clergy collars were created. And now it's time to talk about the collars themselves. Uh, I, as I'm sure you've seen in and around your parish, there are two types of collars. There's the neck band, and what is called the tab collar. Tab collars are much easier to put on, but not all tab collars are created equal. Ha! Ah. So, I have, believe it or not, three different types of tab collar shirts. And every time you buy a tab collar shirt, they give you a couple of tab collars, but you must remember which color goes with that particular apparel. For example, regular older tab collars are this style. Uh, many times you might see it here, and you just slip it in your tab. And um, these uh, go with a certain shirt that I have. But I have one, just one, gray clerical that requires this collar. If I try to stick this in the other one, it will not fit because it has less room. So I have to remember that this particular <laughs> tab collar goes with that gray shirt. And what I normally do is I have two, 
and I keep one as a spare, and in that shirt after it's laundered, I stick this in the pocket to make sure that I don't have to search for it. Then I bought some new uh, tab collars recently. They're so convenient to wear if you're lazy or maybe if it's a very warm day, especially here in Southern California. Um, uh, neckband collars get real hot. Uh, so I prefer to use a tab, but that shirt requires the use of this collar. And if you don't put this collar in correctly, you really look stupid. Uh, the very first time I bought it, I put it in this way. And of course, I looked at it in the mirror and went, oh, that's not right, and figured out that you must do it this way. So the way for me to remember how to stick this particular tab collar in is I call it the happy face. So there we go. You stick that one in. But the collar that is the most difficult to deal with and causes the most issues is the famed dog collar. Now, uh, I just wanted to share a story uh, in that, you know, there are a lot of things you're not told when you're ordained. And um, if you're not lucky enough to have a clergy person tell you some things, uh, you might spend the first month or so um, as a newly ordained clergy person in a lot of pain <laughs> and uncomfortableness, if that's a word. Um, when you buy these collars, you must buy them a half inch larger than your neck size. So if you're a standard person and you have a 15 and a half collar, a neck size, when you buy a shirt, you go up a half. When you buy a band collar, you have to get 16. This shirt is a 16. And so this is 16 and a half <laughs> um, in size. There are different sizes of these. There are ones that are thinner and ones that are taller. I happen to have a long neck, uh, so I opted uh, to get one that was a little bit thicker, but it's just a matter of personal preference. But how do you put these suckers on? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to use some studs. Now, my particular way of wearing a collar, I don't know if other people do it this way, but I use two different sets of studs. You can buy two different type. There is the one like this, which you might remember from prom or this and that, it's just the good old fashioned stud with a flat side here and a little pointy thing there. Then they have these that have a little bracket on them. You can turn it this way and then it goes this way. Um, what I like to do is wear this one in the back and since this is hidden, it's a little bit easier to deal with this because I don't have to clasp it around my neck. So the first thing I do is take this and stick it in the back of my shirt. I already have one here that I have already stuck in. Now this stud, you will notice a little hole here. You take this and you stick it through that hole that way. I know people are tempted sometimes to want to stick it in that way, but that's not what you do because you don't want to have a big piece of metal bothering you. Now this next part just takes time and there are days when you can put the collar on real quick and there are other times your fingers aren't working and you end up struggling with it. But you have a hole here and you stick this in that hole. There's another hole on this side. 
you have to bring it together and slide it in so that the collar is now attached here through that loop there. Then you take this guy and stick it behind you, kind of give that little thing a twist because it's through the hole. There's another hole on the back. You close it. I like to pull it out and just make sure nothing is pinching my skin and you're all set. As I said, there are days where it goes in real easy and there are other days where you're all thumbs and it may take you a few tries, but in time you will get it. So I hope that um, you've been taught properly now how to wear, how to attach, not how to wear, how to attach a clergy collar. I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial about clerical collars. One day in the future, I think it'll be good to come back to this subject to talk about the spirituality of those wearing a collar. What I can say is that who a person is inside reflects on the individual, no matter what one wears on the outside, lay or ordained. We are all called to reconcile this troubled world with an ongoing commitment toward one another because that's what love does. With this in mind, in recent weeks there has been a disturbing uptick of violence upon people of Asian descent. Any form of aggression toward the other is a manifestation of culture's reliance on what is called dualistic thinking. As followers of the way, we are called to think in both and terms. Once people are aware of transactual dualism or either or thinking, in thought, word, and deed. It is easy to see this form of evil behavior throughout your day, and we have a choice to refuse to play this cultural game, separating ourselves from this normalcy of civilization. If you are interested, I suggest you think about what has been described as bystander training. There are Zoom training sessions available to protect the other person on the receiving end of racial or institutional violence. I will provide a link below and suggest you check it out. If you miss a date when this training is available, bookmark the site and check back for future sessions. This training, by the way, was recommended by the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles. Dualistic thinking is and will forever keep society at a standstill in all facets of our existence. That's why I feel the FLOW project is so desperately needed. Since the flow is based on the notion of Trinity, you see it would be impossible to divide three by two. But in order to alter this way of thinking and living, it will require the internal work and an ongoing spiritual discipline to enable personal transformation. I won't be able to give the Flow Project my full attention until I've completed my Compline online videos, which will take me to the end of April. But stay tuned for more information as things happen. Well, that's all I have for you this month. I hope you've made progress with gaining access to your vaccination. 
I was able to get my first shot at the end of February with my second and final inoculation scheduled very soon. Wish me luck. Now is the time to truly think of your neighbor. No matter what your local custom demands or encourages, please consider wearing a mask when you are out and about, even if you've been vaccinated. If you must order food from a restaurant or someplace, hold off dining indoors until we have a better understanding of herd immunity. And if you are truly serious about spirituality and living your life as a follower of the way, we must first think of those around us, considering the most vulnerable, because how we act informs others as to the importance of living your life as an act of love, love of God and of neighbor. God bless and see you next month.